Uh, welcome from the Temerty Center for AI Research and Education and Medicine, otherwise known as TCARAM, to our speaker series, our first speaker series of 2022. I'm Professor Laura Rosella. I'm the education lead, and I welcome everyone on behalf of the entire TCARAM team. I'm here from a very uh, chilly Toronto, uh, welcoming you all here today. I'm absolutely thrilled. We have such a fantastic panel with us today, and I promise you will learn a lot and you will leave thinking differently about AI and medicine, implementation in medicine, I should say. I'd like to start by first acknowledging the land on which the University of Toronto operates. For thousands of years, it has been the traditional land of the Huron-Wendat, the Seneca, and the Mississaugas of the Credit. Today, this is still the meeting place and home to many Indigenous people from across Turtle Island, and we are grateful to have the opportunity to work on this land. The Temerty Centre for AI Research, Education and Medicine at the University of Toronto has made, been made possible by the generous donation of the Temerty family. TCARM is an interdepartmental center that serves as a focal point for collaboration among healthcare providers, trainees, researchers, computer scientists, and engineers, and industry to advance health through artificial intelligence. Just a quick mention to our guests that this is a CPD accredited event. To obtain your CPD credit, please complete the evaluation form that we will email you following the event. And don't forget to provide your name and email address on that form. And last note, uh, we have the Q&A function open. If you have question for, questions for our panelists, please submit them during uh, the, the session. The panelists will either address them live or during the discussion session of the webinar, which will happen in a few moments. So without further ado, I'm going to welcome our wonderful panelists. So I'm going to introduce them all. They are all going to give a very brief uh, presentation to give you some context and speak about their unique experiences. And after that, we will convene our panel discussion. So first we have Dr. Demi Adidenchiwe, who is an assistant professor and non-invasive cardiologist at the Mayo Clinic in Florida with a clinical focus in women's heart health and echocardiography. She's a fellow of the American College of Cardiology and her research interests include cardiovascular epidemiology, cardiovascular disease in women, and the applications of artificial intelligence tools in cardiovascular disease detection. And you're gonna hear a bit about that today. She's a women's health scholar and her research is supported by the Mayo Clinic's Women's Health Research Center. And she's part of the Interdisciplinary Research Careers in Women's Health Program, which is funded by the National Institutes of Health in the US. Next, we have Dr. Alejandro Berlin, who's a staff clinician scientist and radiation oncologist at the Princess Margaret Hospital here in Toronto, as well as medical director of the Cancer Digital Intelligence Pillar. Dr. Berlin leads the clinical deployment of several novel technologies, including PM virtual care efforts, which is a unique pilot deploying an in-house developed e-platform to support a new model of care for prostate cancer survivors, as well as the application of AI-based methods for radiotherapy planning. Also, you will hear a bit about this today. And last but not least, we have Dr. Vincent Liu, who's a research scientist at the Kaiser Permanente Vision of Research and an Associate Professor of the Health Systems at the KP School of Medicine. He's the Regional Director of Hospital Advanced Analytic and Analytics, and in that role, he oversees real-time clinical predictive models in the KP Northern California Health System, which serves over 4.5 million members across 21 hospitals. His research focuses on the intersection of acute illness and sepsis, machine learning, and program evaluation to identify effective treatments to improve acute care outcomes. So as you can see, we have a breadth of clinical applications and a lot to learn. So without further ado, I will pass it over to Dr. Adidensue to kick us off. I'm hopeful that you can see my screen. So I'll just go ahead and get started. All right, then. So today I'm going to be talking about artificial intelligence enabled ECG screening, and I'll walk you through that. Just a quick outline of what I'm going to talk about. I'll describe my clinical work context, what the AI ECG technology is and what it does, and our experience with implementing this technology in practice. 
So a little bit about where I work. So I work at Mayo Clinic in Florida and we have three different sites. The Mayo Clinic in Florida is a bit smaller than the one in Rochester is about 304 beds. And my role, as Laura mentioned uh, earlier, I'm a non-invasive cardiologist. My clinical focus is in women's cardiovascular health. So I tend to see more women. And I also spend time in our echo lab. A lot of my research is focused on um, cardiovascular disparities, pregnancy and heart disease, as well as use of AI for cardiovascular disease detection. Forward, I wanted to talk about the AI ECG technology a little bit. So this technology was uh, developed by a group of physicians and researchers at Mayo Clinic. And one of the first models that was developed was to use the ECG to detect left ventricular dysfunction. This was published in January of 2019 in Nature Medicine. Next, in September of 2019, another model was developed that was able to detect atrial fibrillation even when the ECG is showing normal sinus rhythm. So this model is basically able to detect silent atrial fibrillation. And then in February of 2020, another model was developed, same as well using the ECG to detect the presence of hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. Moving on to 2021, another model for detection of aortic stenosis. And then the most recent one was in July of 2021 for the detection of cardiac amyloidosis. And all of this have significant impact in the cardiovascular practice, being able to detect them early so that we can treat them. I'm gonna be focusing a little bit more on the first one. So this just uh, talks about that paper that was published in Nature Medicine. And this AI technology is based on a convolutional neural network that takes information from a standard 12 lead ECG, the digital ECGs, and is able to give you a prediction, the probability of a low ejection fraction, whether it's less than or equal to 35%. This particular model has actually been validated in different patient populations, and it's found to, be, to have remained robust. The AUC in that model was 0.93, which is pretty remarkable compared to a ton of tests, diagnostic tests that we use in clinical practice, such as an uh, a stress echocardiogram, for instance, with an AUC ranging from 0.83 to 0.89. I'm just going to move on and talk a little bit about a clinical scenario where this AI ECG was used. So I took all of this information from an article that was published. It was a case report published in the Cardiovascular Digital Health Journal. And this was a young male who came into the hospital with symptoms of shortness of breath, low extremity swelling without any prior cardiac history. And on his initial echocardiogram, he did show sinus tachycardia, but the prediction of cardiomyopathy based on the AI, as you can see flagged on the screen in red, that's the P of low EF was elevated. So even before he got an echocardiogram, we were able to pick that this patient actually had a cardiomyopathy just based on the initial ECG, which can be done in a few minutes of arrival in the emergency room. And the images down at the bottom of the screen was just showing the um, MRI that was done on this patient that showed dilated cardiomyopathy. So this AI ECG models have actually been incorporated into our electronic medical record system such that patients will come into the Mayo Clinic. We can actually run a prediction for all of these different things that I talked about as soon as they get an ECG, whether through the emergency room or through the clinic system. I'm going to shift gears a little bit and talk a little bit about a research scenario which applies to what I am using this technology for, which is screening for cardiomyopathies in pregnancy. So in the United States, approximately 700 women die each year from pregnancy-related complications. Two in three of these deaths are believed to be preventable, and the rates are three to four times higher in Black women. We know that cardiovascular disease is the leading cause of death among pregnant and postpartum women in the United States. And when we look among all of these cardiovascular conditions, cardiomyopathy happens to be the leading cause of death. One of the concerns about why this contributes to mortality is there is believed to be a delay in the diagnosis of cardiomyopathy among pregnant women. This is because some of the symptoms of normal pregnancy overlap with cardiomyopathy symptoms, such as low extremity swelling, shortness of breath, orthopnea. All of these things can be considered normal in pregnancy. So how do you know this patient who has a cardiomyopathy or heart failure? So the clinical diagnosis can be challenging and it can be missed. So can we use utilize artificial intelligence in this situation. And that brought up my research question is, can we use AI to identify cardiomyopathy in this population? 
are the models that we have, are they robust enough? Have they been validated in the pregnant patient population so that we know that it works? And is it scalable? Will it be accessible to all without elaborate healthcare infrastructure? And so because of that, we decided to pursue this, which is evaluating this 12 lead model, which was already developed for cardiomyopathy detection in pregnant women. The other part of this project we're hoping to do is um, evaluate the model using portable ECG devices. And I'll talk a little bit more about that in the next few slides. So some of the work that we've done based on retrospective data, we found this model to be effective in pregnant and postpartum women. Our AUC in this article that was published was 0.92. So very close to the derivation model. Now we're in the process of doing validation prospectively to see if this works and does it improve clinical outcomes. So now I wanted to spend some time talking a little bit about the portable ECGs. In the United States now, we have multiple devices that have received FDA approval to record an ECG, including an Apple Watch as well. So this is one of the examples, got FDA approval in 2019. This is the Alive Core Cardia Mobile 6L. And you can record a six lead ECG with this device. So our thoughts are, can you use tools such as this that is readily available in the hands of the patient that does not require a health system to gather information on women? And can you use this to predict the likelihood of cardiac dysfunction? Can we use this for remote monitoring when the patient is discharged from the hospital in that postpartum period where we're not able to follow them? So our thoughts are, can smartphones and portable ECGs be also used for cardiovascular screening? We don't know that yet. We have large validation studies that we're working on as well as data acquisition. Where I see this going, and this is my final slide, is next steps for this project is external validation. We want to make sure that our models remain robust when we take them out of the Mayo Clinic system. I talked already about the pilot perspective study that we're working on, and we're also looking at larger pragmatic studies that are prospective to make sure that this improves clinical outcomes. Our next step will be implementation studies. How do we take this from the research phase and start to use them in our health systems? And over the next few years, we're hoping that our guidelines and our practices will change now that we have better methods of detecting uh, cardiovascular disease. I cannot end my presentation without talking about the team that I work with. So this is the core team that I work with. And as you know, it takes a village to develop something like this and to get things done. So there's a much larger team that I don't have pictures for. So at this time, I'd like to end my presentation and say thank you so much for listening. And I'm going to pass it over now to Ale to um, give us this presentation. Thank you. Awesome. Uh, thanks so much, Demi. And I certainly got excited. I want now my heart being checked by your pipeline, 100%. So uh, I have a bit of a different flavor of a talk because I'm going to be speaking around the therapeutic uh, realm. So I want to share with you what has been our journey from uh, development to deployment. So a lot of people also to thank, this is a teamwork and takes a village and some of the sponsoring agencies behind this work. And I'm not gonna put the sponsoring agencies that have chosen not to sponsor our work just for being a nice player. So uh, some conflicts of interest I don't have. And radiotherapy is usually on the basements of the hospitals. And for many uh, may sound like we work on the catacombs, which is not far from the reality. So I'll have to have to do some work to explain how radiotherapy works. But the good news is that usually close to radiotherapy, there's also a cafeteria. So it's not such a boring uh, area of the hospital. So just in a nutshell, radiotherapy is an essential mode of cancer treatment. And about half of patients will require it as part of their curative or palliative intern uh, treatment. And the process starts all with a medical consultation then acquisition of imaging, uh, uh, morphologic imaging, to then define the areas that you want to treat, a process called treatment planning, which is where the main work we have done to date uh, uh, occurred, quality assurance, and then the treatment delivery. So to mess up things a bit, I'll start by the, by the end. So what is treatment delivery? A patient is laying on a couch, a machine is turning around, a big hardware, a few tons, and in the head of that machine, 
there is what's called a multi-leaf collimator that as it's turning, these leaves are shaping the beam. So there is infinite amount or, or let's say a large vast amount of combinations between the angles and the shape of the beam. And it's such the precision of these that you can print the photo of your favorite scientist on a radiograph with the use of these technologies. So the precision of the delivery is extremely high and sky is the limit. But the sky and the limit is the radiotherapy planning, which we still do on a tailor-made fashion for each and every single patient coming through the doors. So how does this happen? So bear with me, this is my elevator pitch of radiotherapy planning. You acquire morphologic imaging, then we draw circles or some different shapes which uh, define the area that we want to treat and the areas we want to protect. And those are called contours. And then there's a process both of defining certain beams or constraints on the machine and an iterative process of optimization, which is a cost function with a complex algorithms also where different permutations of that machine turning around and those leaves that I show you moving to change the shape of the beam result on certain dose. And if the dose uh, that it reaches your target or the tumor is uh, satisfactorily, uh, you win points. If the dose of organs at risk is too high, you lose points. And the best cost function is would be what we call an ideal plan. And that plan is subject to the evaluation of experts. The challenges, but also the opportunities are that this is very iterative and laborious. It can impact outcomes and that has been demonstrated in, in prospective trials. There's many hands off in the process. You can scale or share these. And in, there is a relatable black box, I like to call it, because the algorithms of the optimization engines are still a black box for many of the users. So here is where the genius comes. And this credit goes to uh, people here at PMH, Tom Purdy and Chris McIntosh. They said, why don't, once we have the contours, why don't we straightforward use historical plans to predict a dose directly and then turn those into a deliverable dose playing with the beam and the multi-leaf collimator. So they reverted the process into this dose prediction. The advantage of this is that now the algorithm can learn these spatial dose distributions and infer what would be the ideal dose distribution for that patient's anatomy, and then have a complete treatment planning that does not have any iteration and does not require any user intervention. So now here we are, we have an incredible solution that in 10, 15 minutes compared to half an hour or several hours, or sometimes they can generate a plan. And what you see at the bottom left is two plans of those distributions of prostate cancer, one generated by humans and actually de delivered to treat a patient. And the other one is the one the generated by the uh, ML algorithm. And unless you're an expert drawing circles, as I, I, I am in, in prostate cancer, you, it's very hard to tell the difference. So now you have these two plans and you have to make potential choices. And that's what we said. Let's go back to historical plans and compare and put it in blind fashion, deliver QA peer-reviewed plans against these ML-generated plans. And to our surprise, the plans, automated plans, uh, perform in approval rating across several metrics of plan quality, very comparable to the uh, clinical plans. Not only that, if the reviewers were forced to choose which plan they preferred, in two, then three fourths of cases, they prefer the ML plan being blind to the treatments. So that was the dilemma we faced. And we said, why should we withhold a treatment that is better, deemed better by experts just because it stems from a different non-human source that we're used to, granted that it uh, fulfills all the quality assurance and QA processes that are in place. So that's how we frame our, our problem. Can these ML tool method predict a dose distribution that it's expected to be judged favorably. And that's an emphasis. We were in the clinical judgment piece of the aspect. And that means either approved or preferred and then actually used to deliver uh, a treatment. So we moved into a prospective clinical deployment. Again, every patient coming through the doors had their usual clinical plan and side to side a blind ML generated plan. 
And in the first case in September 2019, the ML plan was deemed superior and that was used to treat that specific patient. And again, credit to the village that takes here across physicists, radiation therapies, radiation oncologists, managers, so on, that believe that this was the right thing to do for the patients because the, pay the plan was felt to be of higher quality. And the results of our prospective deployment of over 50 patients, we not only saw that the plans rendered by the ML method were clinically acceptable in 90% of cases, but again, in three-fourths of cases were select over human plans. But if you compare the retrospective to the prospective uh, deployment, we saw a change on this. So there were some clinicians were able to see some nuances on the plan that even if they were superior, they could detect that they were uh, generated by the ML method and they prefer the human plans over the others. But still in the majority of cases in the prospective phase, 61% of cases, the ML plans were used to treat patients. So the gains were tangible. Uh, the median saving time per case was around 71 hours, collapsing that complexity of the planning. Obviously, this brings efficiencies. These brought higher quality plans that are consistent. The same methods with the same inputs would give the same output. And if you transfer this method, and we're also in the phase of uh, collaboration with other centers to see how they phase and evaluate and judge plans generated by this ML uh, method. Sorry. Um, so the last thing that I want to mention is now every patient coming through the door not only has one ML plan, but two ML algorithms that generate two plans. And we're again evaluating in a blind fashion technical performance, which plans are preferred because there's different trade-offs in these two methods. And uh, in, if none of the plans satisfies, then we move to a, a, the need for human expertise in these uh, collaboration fashion between ML and humans. So some conclusions and future work for us, uh, and I'm going to try to spice it up because there's a span uh, afterwards. So I think it's possible to bring ML to the therapeutic realm. I think it's not sufficient anymore to do simulated things in, the, in, an, in, in a retrospective environment and the hype is fading you need to evaluate under full clinical integration when patient care is at stake because uh, the acceptance from humans may waver as, a, as, a, as we're, we enter the clinical therapeutic and probably the same holds for diagnostic and prognostics. It's mandatory to have clarity what's the value enhancing proposition and that uh, includes multiple aspects and is essential, as I said, uh, have multidisciplinary lenses and, and, and disciplines involved from technical, clinical evaluation, human factor and ethical aspects of, of the work. What this means for radiotherapy, we're moving from treatment planning into the other uh, parts of the, of the sequence. And my dream in the next three, four years is to have a paradigm of same day consult treatment because we can automate uh, and, and enhance the work that we do every day for our patients here at Princess Margaret and beyond. So with that, I'll thank you very much and happy to take any question and looking forward for the discussion. And I'll pass the baton now to Vincent uh, for the last presentation. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so I think I'm gonna shift gears a little bit and talk about health system uh, integration of predictive models that just so exciting to see all of this technology and talk a little bit about AI deployment in medicine. But when I think about AI, you know, from a health system perspective, I'm thinking about augmented intelligence. And, you know, the difference here is that I think augmented intelligence places the people, the patients, clinicians, and the communities uh, rather than the algorithms at its center. And so my talk, I think is very consistent with what we've already heard from these other uh, presentations. You know, we think about combining these two emerging disciplines, what's data science, you know, the, the, the discipline of working with data um, all of its, in all of its complexity, but all of its potential in order to identify efficiencies and then be subject to algorithms that improve kind of the capabilities for us to effectively draw insights from them. And then delivery science, which is, you know, health system or um, healthcare delivery approaches to ensuring that the most effective inter interventions are developed in a sustainable and robust way 
um, or deliver to, uh, to, to the patients of interest. And it's really this tight handshake, I think, which Ali spoke to as well, this multidisciplinary trust and co-development that's been so important to the um, ability to develop these platforms. To give you a sense of KP for those you know, who are not familiar with the system, you know, we're a national system. We cover about 12.4 million members. Our teams include 24,000 physicians, 64,000 nurses. The middle panel shows a little bit about the scale of our clinical work. 120,000 babies delivered, 2 million colorectal cancer screenings, 93 million prescriptions filled. And then the data, which is there sitting ready to be accessed, you know, 488 million visits to our online portal, um, 7 million visits. Uh, these are taken from the annual report in 2020. And, you know, really this uh, blending of data and delivery science for the um, deployment of this augmented intelligence is really within our origin story. This is an article written by Dr. Sidney Garfield, who was the first physician of Kaiser Permanente. And 50 years ago, he wrote that medical care in the U.S. is expensive and poorly distributed. What we need is an innovative system in which the sick are separated from the well. And really what he was speaking to was use of algorithms in order to most efficiently and effectively move patients to the right domain of care at the right time. So he envisioned here at the top in green that we could separate our populations into groups, including the well, the sick, the worried well, and the early sick. Not everybody needed to go into the same uh, domain of healthcare here, which are represented by those four um, circles with the blue tack. So I've, I've taken the liberty of editing this somewhat, but you can think of diagnostic testing and referral as one domain, hospitals and acute care centers as another, chronic disease management and prevention as another, and then health counseling and education. And 50 years ago, before really we had the kind of advances that we're seeing now in the computing age, he said that there needs to be a computer sitting at the center of this process um, to proactively separate the sick from the well, to then efficiently and effectively direct them to the high value care across these domains. And then ultimately, I think the promise that this process, the data being generated, the algorithms being applied, understanding the efficacy of our interventions would facilitate ongoing learning and improvement. And that's what we're seeing today in the presentations. You know, just the tremendous use of data compared against existing practices, really to unlock a new frontier and potential um, for the use of um, effective treatment algorithms and preventive care um, for our patients. As at patients, as we've thought about this, you know, building out this platform, we've really had to look at the predictive model life cycle. Um, whether that's prioritization, choosing the right high value targets or the modifiable outcomes. Assessment is looking at you know, the landscape, what else is out there, what, what technologies are available or algorithms are already available. Development is building the algorithms, doing calibration, customization, internal validation, and then ultimately technical implementation into the specific computing platform. Deployment is where the algorithm touches real life playbooks, workflows, and user interfaces. And then ultimately we can't forget evaluation, which is where we actually measure, um, is this making a difference for our clinicians and for our patients? And we saw some really nice examples um, in the prior talk. Also thinking about balancing measures, what un unintended consequences has the use of the algorithm engendered in the way we deliver care? And then ultimately these models are becoming like commodities, like the, you know, an iPhone or a car. They continually need to be maintained and upgraded. And so they are themselves not static items. On the red all around the periphery are the folks who need to be involved. And you see, and we've already heard, it takes a village, it takes team, it takes trust, it takes people of all different disciplines because in order to effectively deploy one of, the thing, one of these tools um, in a sustainable and robust way, we need a huge amount of buy-in. Um, this gives some examples of predictive models that we have either deployed or, or, or um, on, the, on the runway. Um, and this is, one, this is a, a list chosen from about 30 or 40 different models that we're working on. I'll mention briefly advanced alert monitor, which is an inpatient deterioration score. 
as well as a readmission risk prevention score. Um, PEARL is uh, looking at inpatient uh, or labor and delivery deterioration among laboring mothers. HIV PREPS looks at patients who have a high incident um, risk of HIV infection to have discussions with them about pre-exposure prophylaxis use. CAST is a, a tool designed to help us risk stratify patients in the preoperative context so that they can uh, be optimized for their surgical procedure. We have suicide risk models, um, which we're evaluating to uh, screen our population, to identify those who are at the highest risk of suicide attempts uh, within the next 90 days. Um, tools that help to screen geriatric patients when they hit the ED in order to ensure that we're minimizing the additional injury or impact of uh, um, the ED environment on them. And then, you know, things like hypoglycemia, because it's, it's a really common phenomena, but significantly under-recognized. Um, you know, and two of our earliest models, we've been able to see really promising results. This article, I think, came out last year in the New England Journal of Medicine about our EHR embedded um, algorithm to prevent inpatient deterioration, which is calculated on all our hospitalized patients on an hourly basis. We evaluated across our 19 hospitals um, and uh, more than half a million hospitalizations and showed that there was a significant reduction in 30-day mortality um, after implementation of the score, as well as all of the workflow and the team that went into kind of evaluating these patients. And not all deteriorations should be met with more aggressive or invasive care. So the program also incre increased um, the amount of care that was goals aligned. And some patients choose not to want to go to the ICU or to be intubated. And so that was a really important balancing measure for us to be able to track. Um, our readmission risk score, which is we call the transition support score. This was just published in the BMJ. Um, you know, similarly, really exciting results. It's an algorithm designed to identify high-risk patients for readmission after discharge. We deployed it across our 21 hospitals, evaluated it in 1.5 million um, hospital discharges and showed about a 10% reduction in readmission rates for medium and high-risk patients um, after the implementation of the score within this kind of um, HALO program called the Transitions Program. And of course, we were uh, another balancing measure, no increase in mortality with program intervention, because there have been concerns that uh, a, a focus on readmission um, has also increased post-discharge mortality. So we're really excited to see that. Now, uh, what does this mean for us? Well, we need to train the next generation in this handshake between data and delivery science. So this is our uh, group of initial fellows in our informatics program. Uh, you can see they come from all different fields, genetic epidemiology, nursing, pharmacy, physician, behavioral psychology. Um, they've gone on to, in some cases, um, uh, academic positions, in other cases, industry or healthcare delivery system. But, you know, this is really important because um, all of the AI-enabled um, deployments that we are going to see, it's, it's incredibly exciting, but requires careful attention to detail. And I'll finish with a similar slide, which is uh, to say that this work is only possible through deep partnerships. And all of these folks have contributed to making uh, AI deployment in medicine, this augmented intelligence to impact patients, um, a success in our health system. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you so much, uh, all three of you, for those phenomenal, phenomenal presentations. Um, well, there's a, an active Q&A uh, section that you can submit chats to. I just want to quickly, before we jump into uh, questions talk about some of the things that just really struck stuck out for me um, Demi you know it really the work is incredibly impressive but what I really appreciate about your framing is talking about the pipeline you didn't talk about any of your algorithms without immediately talking about external validation implementation science change practice guidelines this is not the algorithms is just barely the start and uh, as a clinician leading all aspects of that it was very important 
And Ale, I really enjoyed you talking about um, team trust and tenacity. Um, your use case was very compelling. So, you know, these use cases are, are really important to try and emphasize what we're trying to do, the clinical vision uh, that you articulated. And I really appreciated you talking about quality assurance because that needs to be a critical component of this. Um, and then lastly, Vincent, I mean, that handshake between delivery and data science, I mean, what a beautiful framing for us to take into our uh, panel discussion and actually think through, you know, because that's where we often get plugged, uh, clogged up in, in this process, which is why we planned this speaker series specifically on this topic. And just the impressive pipeline in, across the health system of where you're implementing these was just amazing and motivational. So thank you all so much. Um, again, if you have questions, please put them in the chat and I will keep an eye on them. But I'm going to start us off um, and I'm going to go to you first, Demi, if you could um, just based on your experience and based on the clinical vision you're hoping to impact, can you speak to, if you could speak to the AI ML technology developers, what's the one thing you'd like them to keep in mind at that development and early stage? How can we get started on the right foot? I think that's a great question, Laura, and you know I'm happy to talk about that. One thing that I am particularly passionate about, at least is something that I'm interested in studying, is in disparities. I get a lot of questions from not just patients, people that I work with about, you know, how are we sure that this AI algorithms are going to be great? Are we sure it's going to work in a different patient population? And there's concerns about that which are legitimate because you know we've seen stuff in the literature that talks about AI algorithms being able to also perpetuate bias. So that's a concern. We know that these algorithms learn a lot from the data set that we present to them. And if this data sets have inherent biases, then the results and the predictions from these algorithms can be biased as well. So I would say for AI and ML developers, one thing that needs to be kept at the back of the mind when training some of these algorithms is that they need to be trained on large, diverse patient populations. I know I talked a lot about validation because we need to be sure that this truly works. There was a major issue with uh, a facial recognition algorithm. I'm sure people have heard about this, you know, that was biased and was, you know, more likely to make errors when it comes to like black face as opposed to like white faces and scanning. And that's just because these algorithms were not given enough examples of what black people look like. And for me, this is important in the field that I'm working in when I talk about pregnancy complications being more common among black women. How do we know that these algorithms are not gonna be biased against these women and then their care will be further delayed because we are relying on these algorithms that are just not well-trained. So which is why it's really important. I would say that maybe this might be, unfortunately, the male clinic population is not as biased as the rest of the United States. And even though a lot of our algorithms have worked well in our patient population, we need to ensure that when we take it outside of that environment, that it's gonna work. And this is something that is gonna be useful and helpful. So knowing that from the beginning, ensuring that we are training or creating algorithms based on large databases that are diverse is really important for the future of AI and ML. Excellent point. Um, Ale or Vincent, did you want to add anything to that point or to the question? I, I, I can a short point maybe that for the developer sometimes, I think that just expecting deployment because uh, we have a very good performance or we have a gadget, I don't think that's sufficient anymore. Um, so there's, there's a critical need to understand the clinical question and gap very, very well. And, and that drives the whole thing. If the gap is there and there is a value enhancing proposition, then the case has been made. And by value could be improving outcomes or decreasing cost, improving efficiencies. So it doesn't have to be just clinical outcomes or just cost outcomes, it could be. But I think keeping the, the true value enhancing at the front as a, as a true north with a clear understanding of the clinical problem, then other things should align pretty uh, naturally uh, around that. Great. Um, may, may I'll go over to our, our next question, just in the interest of time. Um, I'd like uh, to go to you, Vincent, to start this one. On the implementation side, what would you say to clinicians? So we're talking a lot about how we need to think about validating these algorithms. 
But let's say a clinician or a health system operator that will never develop an algorithm in their life or be involved with it, but they expect to interact with it. What, what would you say to, to them? And what do you think is the most important piece for them to know as they embark on this new world? Yeah, yeah, I've jotted some notes here. So first I wanna thumbs up Ale's point um, that uh, you have to be absolutely precise about where the use case is. And, and what, is it a clinical outcomes improvement? Is it an efficiency improvement? Both of those are good. I mean, ideally we'd get both. We don't always get that. But we use something like the predictive model Madlib, you know, which is it, as, a, as a person of this role, I would want this specific piece of information at this specific time to make this specific decision, which I can measure the outcomes of in this specific way, right? Sometimes we get folks who are just like a cool gadget or we want to change this whole process. But unfortunately, predictive models like in the, in the data construct and the algorithm deployment are just so constrained to one specific instant in time and, and you know how you develop that cohort that it's really important not to then begin applying them willy-nilly to all different contexts. And I, and I think that speaks to Demi's point as well, that we need data sets that are representative of both the people and the encounters that um, they're ultimately going to be deployed in. I, I think another important um, thing that uh, was a theme here is, is these tools are incremental advances. Um, so it's not that, you know, we don't have anything available today, but, you know, in Ali's uh, example, we have a laborious process for, you know, developing these maps and these enhance or incrementally improve efficiency or in Demi's example, you know, we have, we're usually reactive and what we want to be is proactive about identifying cardiomyopathy um, as a, as a potential adverse outcome following pregnancy. But, you know, it's, I, I consider it, and when we put it as an incremental advance, we don't kind of feel like we're putting everything into this AI. You know, we're saying this is going to make us, you know, 10 to 20% better than where we are today for many of the tools um, that we're using. There are, of course, you know, the level, you know, level up kind of things, which are fundamentally changing our approach. Um, and then I, and then I think we have to be realistic about un unintended consequences. So, you know, sometimes these tools, they give outrageous, you know, um, outputs. And, and, you know, I think it's important to have the clinician there to examine them, right? That QA feature, right? Because sometimes for whatever reason, um, it, you know, maybe 10% of the time, they, they just give something that's implausible. And so it's important for clinicians to understand how to un, um, appreciate those and then, you know, um, either investigate what the source of that discrepancy is, or just use their clinical judgment, you know, tools that currently exist um, in order to mitigate that risk. That's fantastic. And I think uh, Mamatha in the chat has a similar question, I think, just picking up on that point, that, um, you know, whether it's ECGs or radiation uh, planning, are there clinical characteristics that are actually integrated into the algorithms? Or do you see this as playing out in clinical practice in influencing decisions? So what would, uh, what would you all say to that? Ali, I think you were starting to respond to that. Yeah, I, can, I think it will depend on the application. So it sometimes might play into the algorithm. So we're doing now an effort to try to do outcome-based, integrating outcomes into the algorithm of uh, planning. So it's not only dosimetric physical configuration, but also the results of those treatment that were delivered with those, those distributions. In other cases, for example, for different clinical scenarios, you may need two different bespoke algorithms. So what I showed is prostate only. Sometimes we treat prostate plus lymph nodes, in which case you will need another algorithm which learns from different atlases. So I think the, the clinical context will remain extremely relevant, obviously. And depending on the type of variables could be integrated into the algorithm, into the inputs of it, or it might require different sets of, of tools and methods for different scenarios. Right. Demi, do you have any anything uh, to add on this from, from your examples? Sure. I was just going to jump in and say I completely agree with Ali that the clinical context is important. And I think Vincent touched on this as well. It depends on the question that you're trying to answer. And sometimes we feel that some of these AI models are supposed to do it all, but they're not. They're built for specific things. So it depends on what we are trying to achieve. Say maybe in a critical care patient that we're trying to maybe predict outcomes. In some cases, an ensemble model where you have multiple different things, their age, their comorbid conditions might play a role 
in the predictions. But for instance, in a case where you're trying to screen, you also have to think about the ease and the effectiveness of utilizing the tool. Gathering tons of data from patients for screening purposes might be a little bit challenging, makes it difficult to implement on a large scale. Maybe in that case, a single tool might be the more effective way for you to get around and do screening. So it depends on what you're trying to do. Sometimes help you decide on what is the best model to use. Excellent perspectives. I'm, I'm gonna uh, go to another question from the audience, which again, I think all of you will have something to speak about. Um, how are patients involved in the shared decision-making when a machine learning generated treatment plan is, uh, is produced or being considered? And is there, how do you get transparency with the patient and what communication challenges have you faced when you're trying to explain that an algorithm is being used to inform their treatment decisions? Um, I don't know who wants to start I, with this. Yeah, I can. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I'll just give an example from our inpatient deterioration work. You know, we had our regional communications folks looking at how we communicate with the patients. Obviously, the patients don't like, you know, a computer algorithm predicts you have a 28.3% chance of ending up in the ICU in the next 12 hours. <laughs> you know, so, I mean, what we told them was essentially we have tools which we're using to help, you know, sift through the data and understand that you are, you know, that you're at heightened risk and, and we're just checking in on you. Because again, you know, a lot of these screening algorithms, um, they have a number of false positives as part of, you know, trying to identify the true positive. So not everybody obviously who gets flagged will go on to experience the outcome. Um, so, you know, trying to, to, to communicate in a, a hopefully a non-threatening way, I think we need to do a better job of having patient representation as we're developing these um, so that we can really build trust with them and communicate and, and elicit the areas which are, you know, which they can really um, uniquely provide important input. I don't think it's been something we've done extremely well, but I, I think it is part of this pipeline and platform that we, we need to be considering. Excellent. Uh, Demi or Ali, do you have anything else to add on that? So I can add a little bit to that just to say that um, I know that there's concerns about a, an algorithm predicting, you know, your treatment plan, but I feel that the stage that we are, at least in the United States, when it comes to using algorithms for patient care, it's not automated because there's always a difference between, you know, automating something. It's not like the prediction comes out and that's it. The doctor doesn't think anymore. They just go based on that. Really, this is supposed to improve your physician's diagnostic ability. And usually like in the examples that I gave, if there's a prediction that something is abnormal, we don't go based on just that. You still have to get an echocardiogram. We need to know the number. Then we have to talk about the medications that might be appropriate for you. And just like Vincent pointed out, algorithms are not perfect. You know, I presented AUCs of 0.93, but we do have false positives. What does that mean? Some of our studies are showing that in the false positive cases, even if they don't have a cardiomyopathy now, they have a higher likelihood of a cardiomyopathy over the next four years. And does that mean that patient needs to be seen more regularly by their physician, like Vincent pointed out? We're just coming in, checking on you, making sure that we can be proactive instead of waiting for something to happen and then be reactive. Excellent. Uh, excellent insights. Okay, we have, and thank you, uh, Michelle Kwong, for those that great question. Um, we have another question from the audience, uh, which I think is very interesting from Tom Waddell, and I'm going to uh, bring it up here because it's a slightly different angle. Um, in cancer genetics, we've made a lot of progress by developing public data sets and genomic profiling from multiple institutions. Is this the way that we can go with machine learning? Can we develop larger clinical data sets and perhaps even use tools that we can't currently foresee? So talking a little bit about the data. Uh, maybe Ali, do you wanna start on this one? Uh, yes, yes, and yes uh, is the answer. I think uh, data in academic medicine, we have been very protective and we tend to think, oh, there's a, this, uh, this is a gold mine that it's sitting on my basement, so I don't want to share it with, uh, with anyone. Um, so I think the value of the data will be the more it's used and the more it uh, flows, then the better. Uh, so I, I totally agree with uh, also how the question was framed. I think the true value of these uh, advanced uh, methods uh, 
is to unveil um, characteristics or features or relationships that by standard methods are very difficult or impossible to foresee. So the larger the data set, the more annotated, the better data governance and provenance frameworks you have to understand where the data comes from, who controls that data, and that the relevant people are engaged in the analysis so it's properly interpreted and uh, and the, there's sufficient amount of metadata to bring that context where that was acquired is different than EKG at home than EKG and the eMERGE, even though they might look similar, they might have some nuances that point to different interpretation or thresholds of how they should be interpreted. So totally, yes, I think academic medicine is doing a disservice, but not having greater open sourceness, greater transparency, and greater data sharing policies that we currently have. So that's something we need to work hard towards. Yeah, and I'm seeing a lot of nods. And, you know, the, again, just if we really want to make progress in this field, that seems like something we all have to work on. It, it addresses the uh, representation in our data sets, a lot of the bias issues, the validations that needs to happen. So I think this is definitely a critical point. Yeah. Um, go ahead, Vincent, please. I, I'll just make a quick comment. I yeah. mean, they say AI tools can be very brittle. And I think that's a good term is, is when something what that seemingly small to us changes, they can shatter um, or, or really perform poorly. And, and I think so the points that all I made is right. And, um, you know, developers need to be aware that this is very much a, a challenge and be prepared to um, pivot around it. And of course, you know, more sharing um, is one of the solutions to, to mitigate that. Great. I'll, I'll go to another audience question and, th and then I want to talk to you about training and capacity building. Uh, but just briefly, I wonder if we could all go around. We have a question from Alistair Johnson on how you integrate non-clinical science into the clinical environment. So you all really talked about the need for this team and there's a team behind all of these examples that you gave. But how do they fit in, and um, and what what's been your experience? Maybe we'll just go Demi, Ale, and Vincent just to quickly talk about this to the non clinical scientists in the audience. So I would see that it's kind of like the same way we have it in clinical medicine, where we you know leverage on all of the different specialties. Even though I'm a cardiologist, we have subspecialties within cardiology, and we leverage on each other's experience and expertise in different fields. And I think that that's where the data scientists, the data engineers, come in. For me, I started getting interested in AI towards the end of my fellowship training before I uh, started uh, full time practice as a cardiologist, and I wanted to learn a bit more about it. So even though at my background, I have an MPH you know, I uh, spent some time learning SAS programming. I worked at the CDC for a while as a data analyst. I was like, well, I'm not terrified of programming, but it's a whole different world when it comes to AI and ML programs. I actually got a professional certificate from MIT in machine learning and AI so that I can bridge that gap between being a clinician and then the data science speak as well so that, you know, I can understand both worlds so that we can bring this team in and be able to utilize this technology. And then I can explain to my clinical colleagues exactly what we're doing, but I think that every member of the team is important. I do not think that physicians can do this alone. We cannot. I mean, we spend a lot of time training for something else. You need a data scientist to be able to do some specific things. And there's some other parts of it that you need a data engineer. So finding the right expertise is important in putting a team together if you want to develop and implement AI models. Great. Ale? Yeah, I would say the key word there on the question is integrate. I think that it's true integration of uh, interdisciplinary uh, fields. Uh, I, as the director of digital intelligence and before data science and smart cancer care, I've been able and privileged to work with human factors, designers, uh, engineers, healthcare informatic developers. And, uh, and I would not only say we clinicians are not equipped to solve this problem, I think we need to bring everyone to the table uh, with lots of respect uh, and, uh, and value with as equal actors. I think uh, when people come to the clinic, sometimes they will say, why are you doing this stuff this way? It doesn't make any sense because they come with a fresh eye, with a different lens, 
and that's in that interface is where I, I think the, the, the magic kind of happens. So it's truly integrating, open the doors of the clinic, open the doors of research of your problems, put different phenotypes and, uh, and genotypes on the table, put a diverse group uh, of people with different lenses and work to improve healthcare. I think that's a very lofty and compelling. We're, we're all patients to some extent, so we, ca we can all relate to, to the problems that healthcare faces. Absolutely, yep. Vincent, what, what are your perspectives? Uh, I mean, I second both of those comments. I will just say, if you are a non-clinician interested in AI in the audience and you wanna make an impact, we are ready to receive you because we need help, all of us. There's just not enough hands to do the type, the, the amount of work that's needed. So um, if you don't find you know, an open door somewhere, keep looking because those places that are not opening their doors don't recognize the massive need that they have. And so they're probably not the right place to look. Yeah, and uh, I, I, th I think that's fantastic. And, you know, we talked a little bit about training and background. So I think I'm going to skip that and just move to our final question. The time has flown by. Um, but I really want to get all of your, you are the leaders you're actually doing and working on the implementation, which is why we want to speak to all of you. I would like a final word from each of you, where you see AI and medicine in five to 10 years, what's the future? What are we working towards? And I would say, because you're among the furthest along, I'm really interested to hear your expect, uh, perspectives on this. So let's start with you, Demi. Sure. So I guess my future outlook, at least for AI, is one of the optimistic one. I know that initially there's all of the concerns, there's all of the, you know, holding back. But, you know, this is the same um, kind of reaction we get with any new technology. There's that healthy skepticism that we have. Are we sure that this is going to work? Are we sure this is the right thing? You know, is the AI going to replace the physician? You know, is this what we should be doing? Should we be worried about AI taking over the world? But I feel like over time, as we start to establish the effectiveness of some of these models, as we start to have maybe trials that are starting to show an impact on clinical outcomes, which is what we need in the clinical space. That's what we're used to, evidence-based medicine. And once we start to see all of this, I think over time, this will kind of become more commonplace and we can start to see them show up in our guidelines. We can start to see them change in clinical practice, impacting patient care. Ultimately, what we want to do is improve the care of our patients. So my hope is that over the next five to 10 years, we start to see AI become a little bit more mainstream. People get more comfortable. People understand it more. And hopefully this improves you know, care that we provide to patients. Excellent. Uh, Ale, last uh, visionary thoughts. Yeah, so I have a, um, a classic answer to this type of question, and it's not copyrighted, so you can, you can just use it. But I hope that uh, any vision or any statement that I do is awfully wrong and falls short, because otherwise it would be extremely boring that I can predict where we're going to be at five, 10 years. So, but that being said, I, I would love uh, and, and gets me excited to think that uh, we start converging. I think there was a lot of words uh, and, and comments here around breaking silos and, and bringing multiple disciplines. And I think these uh, convergence of, of different uh, expertise, different people coming to solve uh, problems in healthcare that are long due to and are waiting there to be solved. Um, human errors, uh, you, you name it, like misdiagnosis, uh, poor prediction, poor treatments, et cetera, et cetera. So that is, is one of the things that I would love. And the other thing it would be extraordinary in the five, 10 years is if we can put system in place, like what Tom mentioned in one of the questions, these pool transparent open source where we don't only put the models and the raw data to generate models, but also how humans reacted to it. What happened after so we can kind of close the loop because we tend to assume that the human is going to do certain thing with the right information, but that's not the case. And we have learned it in our study and over and over. We have learned it with vaccines now that are there, are there to be used, but there's still people that do not follow, let's say, the standard behavior for understandable reasons. So we need to learn why and we can improve these models so uh, they, can, they can not only reflect the best or predict the best with the data available, but also take into account this human aspect 
and, and predict that human aspect better. Absolutely. Vincent, last word to you. Yeah, I mean, I, I think, for example, image analysis is at a new frontier. And in five years, I mean, we will have fully embedded, you know, uh, you know, whether it's uh, imaging or EKGs or, or any of that. And, and so the, the, those disciplines, they'll be different. They will be managing large, large sets of algorithms in the way that they practice. Um, and then I think on the kind of clinical predictive model side, I mean, I hope we're running a thousand predictive models in five to seven years. I mean, that's going to be a beast to manage, but um, every trying to find every efficient, you know, and effective intervention. And even if we gain 5% across all of that, that's a huge amount for the health system in terms of savings, in terms of workforce, um, but hopefully in terms of patient outcomes, really. Um, so I see that as a real, I mean, a, an aspiration, but, you know, tangible goal in the next five to 10 years. Amazing. Well, we've run out of time. I feel like we could have been here for another hour. I want to sincerely thank each and every one of you. This was educational, but also inspiring. Uh, we might have to have you back and hear more because uh, we learned so much and packed so much into this time. Thank you to each and every one of you for your time. Thank you for the audience members for your great participation and for attending. Wishing you all the best and uh, take care, stay safe, and we'll talk soon.